Hi, my name is Jan Wilczek from dwoolsound.com. Welcome to Wolf Talk, a podcast about audio programming. In this podcast, you will learn how to build your career in programming or research related to audio, meet programmers and researchers from all around the world, and learn about the intricacies of sound. Hi everyone, and welcome to the 12th episode of the Wolf Talk podcast. Today I really envy you because you get a chance to meet Meinhard Müller, a professor in music processing and music information retrieval at the Audio Labs in Erlangen in Germany. So Audio Labs is a joint institution of the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg and the Fraunhofer Institute. And the Fraunhofer Institute may be known to you from the development of the audio format called MP3. I believe it is quite known nowadays. I personally studied at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg a program which is called Advanced Signal Processing and Communications Engineering. It's a master's program through which you, every student, gets to choose their mentor. And my mentor was Professor Emanuel Habetz, who I hope one day will be able to come on the show and share his knowledge, his expertise. Today, we're also ex- incredibly lucky because we're interviewing exactly his colleague, Maynard Miller. And that will be one of the topics that we'll discuss what makes a good mentor, what traits a good mentor should have. It's something that may be valuable to everyone who has their own mentorees, also in the university setting, but not limited to it. So during my master's studies, I did Professor Müller's music processing analysis course, which was very, very interesting. But also this course allowed me to read his book, which is called Fundamentals of Music Processing. And this book is simply phenomenal. Phenomenal. It's written so clearly, so plainly. Every new piece of knowledge builds on the previous one. And I can really ensure you that in my writing of articles on the blog and creating the videos, I try to follow Professor Miller's style because I found it incredibly clear and incredibly transparent. And the one that really allows you to understand the concepts but also then to refer back to them when you need them. So this book is really, really incredibly valuable. In this podcast episode, we'll talk about the path of Professor Müller to how he became a world-class expert on music information retrieval. We'll also discuss what is important in one's scientific development and development of academic careers. It may be especially valuable for PhD students, but also for doctoral candidates who are considering doing a PhD in the area of audio, but not only. Then we'll also discuss the process behind writing his book. So what, how the idea appeared and how Professor Müller was able to put this idea into reality. I personally found it very inspiring. Then we'll talk about the professor's daily life, which is something for people outside of academia, but also inside academia is sometimes maybe kind of a mystery. And we'll finally discuss what's the role of artificial intelligence and deep learning in music processing nowadays, because it's obvious that this is quite a hot topic, so to say. So it's, in my opinion, interesting to hear well-known experts' opinion on this topic. As usual, all people, places, and references mentioned in this podcast episode can be found under dwoofsound.com slash talk012. So once again, the episode notes to this podcast episode are under dwoofsound.com slash talk012. And if you're interested in putting this music processing knowledge into practice, I have a resource just for you. It's my free audio plugin developer checklist, which you can get for free at dwoonsound.com slash checklist. It lists every bit of knowledge that I believe is necessary to become a full-fledged audio developer. 
And now, Professor Meinhard Müller. Hi, Meinhard. Thanks for agreeing on this interview. Hi. Could you? Yeah, it's nice to see you again after two years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One thing I remember from your lectures is that you said you can call me, call me Meinhard, you can call me Professor Müller, but please don't call me Professor Meinhard. <laughs> so uh, I try. <laughs> let's, let's stick to Meinhard. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, try, I try to do this. So could you please briefly introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, it's my pleasure. So uh, as you said, I, my name is uh, Meinhard Müller and I'm professor for semantic audio signal processing at the, now it becomes complicated, Friedrich Alexander <laughs> Universität Erlangen Nürnberg in Germany. So uh, as you know, I belong to the International Audio Laboratories Erlangen, which are part of the university and the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits, IIS. Uh, I've moved with my family to Erlangen in the year 2012, so a bit more than 10 years ago. Uh, I'm married. I have two daughters who are on their way to independence, being 16 and 19 years old, meaning I have more freedom again <laughs> since a <couple laughs> years. And... Uh, I really have to say that I'm fortunate to live within walking distance of my institute. And I also feel very privileged that I really like what I do and that I can do what I like. Yes, and uh, I, can, I can only confirm that you really like what you do. And we'll definitely touch on, on more of it later on in the podcast. So the first uh, question that I would like to ask you is that... Uh, Typically, people in the audio industry or audio research have a strong personal interest in music and they often often play some musical instruments. So how was it for you? Yes, it's the same for me, definitely. So, I mean, I have less of a background in audio technology, but I have an intuitive and personal approach to music, let's say. So I have played the piano mainly classical music, since I was six. Uh, I do not have a professional background or a formal education in music, but I still love playing the piano, even though in recent years I only find little time and energy to do, to do so. Yeah. yeah. So for me, for me, it's, it's the same thing. <laughs> so uh, then when, since you had such a strong interest in music, then how did your career then in audio research develop your academic career? <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, I have a short or a longer, a longer answer. So, the, yeah, please go with a long one. A longer version, <laughs> okay. Because in my academic career, I took quite a number of detours before finding my way to, to music and audio processing and uh, to my current profession. So maybe even let me, let me start after graduating from high school. Uh, because after that, I, I did community service as a substitute of military service uh, for almost two years, uh, working and spending time with uh, disabled and elderly people. And this experience had a huge impact on my personal development. So I found that although I also have loner qualities, so to say, the relationship and communication with people are really essential to me. Um, so after these two years, I studied mathematics at the University of Bonn. So the decision was that I really wanted to do something deep, one thing going deep rather than doing many things, so to say, on a more shallow level. And uh, that's also where I did my diploma uh, in the field of algebraic topology. So that's uh, an area within pure mathematics. And during my master studies, I also was a, a one-year exchange student at Louisiana State University in the U.S., and the nice thing with U.S. Uh, universities is that you can also have a minor subject in, in a completely different field. So that was the only year where I also took piano lessons, so to say, at university as a minor subject. Um, 
After graduation, I then went to Japan to study Japanese for a year and then continued with a PhD in theoretical computer science back uh, at Bonn University with uh, Professor Michael Clausen being my supervisor and mentor. And we may come back to him uh, at a later time. Uh, with him, I studied efficient algorithms within a computer algebra context. And that's where I first encountered the fast Fourier transform. So the famous FFT algorithm, leading me the first time to the realm of audio and music processing. But after my PhD, I took another detour and worked as a postdoc in combinatorics. So back to mathematics in Japan for 18 months, one and a half years before returning to Germany and getting finally actively involved in music and audio processing. So from that time on, so at a pretty late stage of my academic career in the year 2003, I really delved deep into the field of music information retrieval. That's how our, that's how our community is called. But I also started other related topics on time series analysis with applications, for example, in human motion analysis. After my habilitation, that's this additional qualifying exam we have in Germany for becoming a professor. That was in 2007. I then moved to the Max Planck Institute for Informatics in Saarbrücken, being a, a junior research, so to say, group leader, where I joined the computer graphics lab headed by Professor Hans-Peter Seidel. And at that time, I continued with music processing, but I also closely collaborated with uh, researchers in computer graphics and computer vision. And then finally, in 2012, I moved to the audio labs in Erlangen. And yeah, even though I now mainly focus on audio and music-related topics, I really have to say that I benefit greatly from having worked actively in many different research areas in computer science and mathematics and also getting to know many groups and institutes from the inside. Definitely. And uh, could you maybe uh, share what was the name of the scientific institution that you stayed with in Japan? Oh, that was uh, uh, Kyo University. That's the big private university in uh, Tokyo, Yokohama. And I was there in the math department. Nice, nice. So uh, when you then became part of the audio labs in 2012, mm -hmm. but uh, to people maybe who don't know FAU, who don't know, you know, Fraunhofer, could you maybe explain what, what is Audio Labs exactly? Okay. So as I, as I said before, the Audio Labs are a joint institute of the university here in Erlangen and the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits. So that's one of the 40, 50, 60 Fraunhofer Institutes that exists within the Fraunhofer Society. That's a publicly funded society supporting applied research. Opposed, for example, to the Max Planck Society, which mainly supports fundamental research. Uh, so to understand the audio labs better, you, you need to know that Erlangen can be considered yeah, a kind of the birthplace of the MP3 audio format, audio coding format. So even though different groups and locations contributed to that format. But Fraunhofer and the university here were main players in, in these efforts and that were pretty hard efforts and many standardization activities before MP3 became finally yeah, a worldwide success story, making Erlangen and also the Fraunhofer IIS here a world leader in audio and multimedia engineering. Being now a public organization and not a company, Fraunhofer, so to say, reinvested part of the MP3 license income for the benefit of society by founding the Audio Labs roughly maybe 12, 13 years ago. 
And in particular, thanks to this uh, construction, uh, six endowed professorships were set up at the university here in Erlangen-Nürnberg. Currently, we are five audio labs professors teaching and researching on audio-related topics, including, for example, audio coding, spatial audio, multi-channel audio, virtual acoustics, and music processing, just to name a few fields. And we all share the same infrastructure, so we consider us as one big team rather than individual professors, so to say, with their own teams. And despite, or maybe better, because of our different backgrounds, uh, this collaboration, this institute works extremely well. Also thanks to our mutual trust and, and, and personal respect. Uh, I think that among the professors, I'm the most academic one within the audio labs. Also having this uh, habilitation and uh, Max Planck background, so to say, with a strong focus on fundamental research and uh, education. Uh, I consider myself really fortunate uh, that I was able to get hold on uh, of one of these professorships and uh, about 10 years ago, being part of this extreme, yeah, excellent team and an extremely helpful and, and nice uh, research environment. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And I can, I can only confirm that it's really amazing uh, the, the variety of topics related to audio that are explored at Audio Labs and what you can learn about there. So I, I, I really, as a, as a student, experience this, that it's really an amazing place and uh, it's great that it's also an amazing place to work at. So related to work, could you maybe share what are your current duties at Audio Labs? I mean, uh, it's the same as a free regular professor at a university as we are, meaning doing research, cool research, hopefully, education, teaching, and self-administration. So we are pretty free in what we do and how we research and, and find our own research group and research agenda. But of course, being in the close, uh, so to say, neighborhood or being within the Fraunhofer Institute, so to say, we are closely connected to people working at Fraunhofer. Of course, we get inspired by the research being done at Fraunhofer and we also contribute to their research. So many of our students, uh, they become uh, uh, or find a job at Fraunhofer after, uh, yeah, after finishing their studies here. Or vice versa, many people working at Fraunhofer find back their way to university and then doing a PhD, for example. Yeah, so I think from the outside, it may be quite difficult to understand, you know, what's the connection between Audio Labs, Fraunhofer, uh, FAU University, but actually these are kind of three separate units that collaborate very closely together. Is it correct? Yeah. It's somehow different units, but at the same time, it's in, intentionally that you cannot tell apart these three units. Okay. So I would say it's a smooth transition from one unit to the other. And many professors, they also have group. Yeah, they also work as a group leader or even as the department head at Fraunhofer. And, uh, and, and many people at Fraunhofer also supervise students. So you cannot really uh, tell apart these units. Yeah, that's that's great. That's great because I believe, yeah, good research comes with good good collaboration. And uh, speaking, you mentioned your your research group. Could you uh, maybe share a few words? Uh, how did you organize your the work of your research group and how it uh, of whom it consists? Yes, uh, sure. So uh, within the audio labs, uh, I have a small research group of around five PhD students all working on music-related research topics. So I really focus on music in my group. Uh, I decided to have a small research group. So uh, in the last 15, 20 years, I always had five students, five PhD students, not more. 
And this allows me to closely collaborate and interact with all my group members. So uh, I do not want to be just a research manager. Yeah. So I still want to be an active researcher who cares about also technical details and mathematical details. Uh, furthermore, it's important to me that everyone in my group knows and understands what the others are working on and doing. And this allows us to work closely together, share data, share code, ideas, and most importantly, share our enthusiasms. So I think uh, that I may say that we are a tight-knit team where we support each other and work on various projects jointly rather than working on projects separately. And I think similarly with our master's students, we try to create an environment of mutual trust and, and support. And that works much better with a small group. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great to hear. And uh, you mentioned the, the master's students. So for those of uh, you, you listening who don't know, I was also a student of advanced signal processing and communications engineering at FAU. And I also had the pleasure of having class with uh, Professor Mueller, with, with uh, Meinhardt. And uh, for people outside of the FAU, could you please maybe explain uh, what is your role in this uh, very specific study program, master study program focused on signal processing? Mm -hmm. So exactly, uh, you have been one of our students uh, of ASD, which is uh, a so-called elite master program uh, on uh, signal processing, communications, and also machine learning, of course, being an important part, which was specifically supported by the state of Bavaria. But what I say uh, would refer to any study program, so to say, uh, ranging from uh, electrical engineering to uh, computer science or artificial intelligence, data science, all master, so to say, study programs we have here uh, at Erlangen. Now, as for ASD, uh, I think one can say, one may say that a unique feature is that students can make individual contact with research groups and professors at a very early stage. So as you know, we already met uh, in the first week of ASD, of your first semester, uh, where the students got to know professors and then could pick their mentor, so to say. Um, well, what's, what's the role of a mentor? What's, what does it mean to be a good mentor? Uh, uh, maybe you can you can answer better. <laughs> uh, maybe as an obvious task, so to say, uh, a mentor should give good advice on study-related aspects. I mean, discussing, for example, maybe specializations you you may do in the program, or maybe indicate possible career paths. I mean, that's kind of the obvious obvious thing, but. Maybe more importantly, uh, maybe we should take time and at least try to carefully listen to our students and support them in their personal development, <laughs> which is not an easy task in the light of the busy day-to-day -day activities and, and business, so to say. Uh, so I'm not sure, I may not always succeed as a good mentor, but uh, at least I try to make time for my students and, and, and their specific needs. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, I, I, I definitely agree that, you know, in the times when lecture halls are filled sometimes with hundreds of students, not only the professor like cannot have the time for each and every one of them, but also the students find it hard to, to get access to their professor to ask them a few questions. In that regard, ASC is, is really special that you get the chance to get all your questions answered, all your questions answered. And uh, this may range from, from anything, right? <laughs> from, from, from research advice to, to life advice, mm -hmm. but, uh, what made it very special for me, I was I was uh, 
blessed also with a great mentor, Emmanuel Habetz, who I know is a colleague of yours. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the most important uh, thing in life in that sense that a mentor is opens many doors, opens many doors for other students. And uh, these, these may be figurative doors or literal doors. This may be doors to collaboration with other researchers, but this may also be doors that expand uh, your mindset and your knowledge about uh, what is happening currently in research, what is possible in audio. Like students always get a kind of basic kind of limited view on the research world, on the if, even on the industry. And a professor who already has 20, 30 years of experience, they uh, know how various areas of research interact and they know that certain areas exist and then they can share it with the students. They can share the resources, they can point to new directions. Uh, and you know they can help ground collaborations and yeah to have this time to listen to them that's 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 really at the heart of it and and jan i i have to say that i have made exactly uh, the same experience in in my academic life so to say so i was really fortunate to have had much to have had much support from exceptional people in my academic career so if i may mention some of them uh, just as an example hmm. Please, please do. Uh, for example, my PhD supervisor and mentor at Bonn U University was uh, Michael Clausen, Professor Clausen, whom I mentioned already before. And besides this uh, mathematical knowledge, uh, I was really impressed, or he really impressed me a lot because what he did was really he put people first. It was always the person he put first, never great or research money or so he really took time uh, taking people serious and then the same with my supervisor in Japan uh, during my postdoc time he was called uh, Masakazu Jimbo actually he offered me a postdoc position in his group without knowing me on a personal level he trusted me somehow and again, he was a person who really cared about his students. Yeah. Later in my career, I benefited greatly from Professor Hans-Peter Seidel, who is uh, the director, one of the directors uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Saarbrücken. And what he did is was he gave me all the support and trust I needed to develop as an independent researcher. He just trusted me. I could do whatever I wanted. I could ask him uh, anytime, any kind of advice. And he was exactly the kind of door opener you really need in, uh, in, in your academic career. So as you just mentioned, I also believe that uh, such personal encounters, uh, uh, they have shaped me a lot. And so what I try to do is I try to pass uh, such experiences and support on to the next generation. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And I can say that exactly the same attitude. Uh, I try to pass on all my men mentorees and, and coaches uh, with, you know, developing this, this experience. And it's not always, it's not always easy. It's not always easy to find the time to, to understand what is the problem, right? You can hammer you can you can hammer the student with low grades, but sometimes the problem is is uh, somewhere else. And as you said, taking the time, putting the trust, and understanding the the individual should be should be at the heart of it. So, uh, unfortunately, you cannot mentor everyone. <laughs> you cannot mentor everyone, even if you wanted to. You say that your your research group is is limited. What I what I totally understand, but to to people listening, to people who maybe are pursuing a, a PhD in audio right now, or maybe are students at the university right now, uh, I know that these may be a little bit two different groups. But would you able to give them some advice 
in the area of audio research? I mean, that's, that's, that's a big topic, a, a wide field, so to say. And uh, if you may allow me, I will try to give an answer maybe to the more general question on what are common goals of doing a PhD, in, at least from my perspective. And then we may come back to the audio domain. Hmm. Um, okay. So I think uh, pretty obvious is that one general goal of doing a PhD is definitely to advance the knowledge in a specific research area. Okay. So you need to go beyond somehow. And at the same time, it's a qualification phase. So when doing a PhD, you should acquire the skills of becoming, let's say, an independent researcher, a problem solver. Yeah. And along with this, you should also learn to communicate your research results. This is what I call writing publications or giving talks, scientific discussions. So it's not about increasing your publication count and your citation count. It's really learning by doing, learning to defend your results, learning to communicate your results to people outside the group. That's what the review process is good for. Also, when you think of applied research uh, yes, in fields such as music and audio processing, uh, one important skill is to learn how to collaborate with and to guide other people in their scientific work. So being a PhD, you also would give advice to maybe PhD, uh, to other master students, bachelor students, yeah, internship students. Uh, so you not only benefit or learn from your supervisor, you also pass down this knowledge and at the same time acquire these uh, communication skills. So in summary, uh, one can definitely say that doing a PhD is not always easy. You need to break new ground. You need to develop as a person and you have to step out of your comfort zone. This can be painful. This is painful, as we all know. So this requires courage in some way and it requires a high degree of intrinsic motivation. Yeah. At the same time, it also requires the appreciation and support of your direct environment. Yeah. So doing a PhD is much more than simply acquiring an additional qualification. Ideally, uh, I, I know I'm pretty idealistic in this in, 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 at the moment, but ideally doing a PhD should be a phase of your life that you hopefully remember as a positive, formative, fascinating experience. So to answer your original question, what do I advise to people who consider pursuing a PhD in audio, music, or whatever field. You should keep your fascination with the subject, so you should love what you do. You should be persistent and diligent. So as for other domains, let it be sports or music, talent is not enough. I mean, you do not need superhuman capabilities, but you need to be diligent on a daily basis over a couple of years. You should communicate your ideas and, particular, and particularly also should communicate your needs clearly. Yeah. You should look for a research environment where you get the kind of support you need and also can give support to others. So it's a two-way thing. But I think communication, trust, honesty, that are all fundamental, uh, fundamental prerequisites for, for being uh, yeah, successful uh, with a PhD and enjoying it uh, for most of the time. 
So I understand that uh, these are also traits that you observed in your more most uh, successful, most fulfilled PhD students. Is that right? Yes, I think so. I'm, okay. The world is not black and white. So the, yes, the, yes. The white side, so to say. But if you don't have intrinsic motivation, if you are not a structured person who knows what he or she wants, yeah, if you don't formulate your needs, Uh, you, you, there will be many, many misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. yeah, for example, the, the, the topic of finishing a PhD. Some people say, oh, it was my supervisor who let me not finish because there were so many uh, research issues left and so on. Uh, yes, it's a never-ending story. There are always open, open research issues. Uh, uh, at the end of your PhD, you start getting a feeling of what you may have, should have done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's also up to you to say, that's it. And to formulate that you want to finish to your supervisor and to your environment and be pragmatic about it. So it's really a two-way thing, not, not a one-way thing. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But I also believe that that's why people who... Uh, completed their PhDs and defended their PhDs uh, should be proud of themselves, of their accomplishments, and should be thankful to their mentors for the accomplishments. And the mentors, I believe, also in this case can can be proud of each and every one of of their PhD students who defended themselves or or consciously decided to drop the PhD. Mm -hmm. realizing that it's not their thing and that's also fine that's also okay i think you're completely right so that's and that's something you typically realize not after three or four years that's something you you have learned or should have learned after a year or so yeah and then moving maybe to another place stopping a phd or even moving to another research group uh, should not be considered as failure mm -hmm. or, yeah It's maybe just another detour uh, you may benefit from uh, at a later stage. Exactly. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for saying this. Is there something you would need, you would like to add on this topic? No. That's okay. okay. Fine. Because I wanted to move to a slightly uh, different area mm. because uh, you've published uh, a book that I, I consider widely cited. It appears at a lot of places it's called the fundamentals of music processing and i, I personally love this book uh, because it it hits right something that a lot of uh, you know blog posts other books or sometimes also research articles don't do as well it, it ex explains every concept step by step from ground up with equations with references And everything builds on top of the previous, uh, previously explained concepts in a very structured way, in a very clear way that none of the sentences is ambiguous and so on. I, I could go on and on about the advantages of this book. Obviously, everyone, everyone should read it. <laughs> but <laughs> Or the advertisement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but... <laughs> so this chat is not about the book, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm not getting I'm not getting paid for advertising this book. <laughs> But um, maybe could you, uh, ask, um, if you could maybe advertise this book in the sense, could you explain what this book is about to people outside of the music information retrieval research field? Mm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, first of all, I, I really want to say that writing this book was very important to me. That was an internal, whatever, motivation again. It reflects my long-term experience as, as a researcher and teacher in music information retrieval. Uh, so as for the content and the structure, I, I designed the book as a textbook. Uh, hopefully suited for students, lecturers, and researchers in different fields, not only engineering, but also neighboring fields, people who are interested in learning about audio and, and music processing. So the book covers essential topics in music information retrieval, MRR, including topics like beat tracking, 
chord recognition, structure analysis, melody estimation. So extracting semantic information from music recordings. But uh, these MRR scenarios mainly serve as motivation, as motivating scenarios, so to say. And then I would introduce fundamental techniques and algorithms applicable to a wide range of analysis, classification, and retrieval problems. So topics that are relevant beyond the music domain. For example, I covered in detail the Fourier analysis, alignment techniques, hidden Markov models, the concept of similarity matrices, non-negative matrix factorization, just to name a few techniques. So it's more classical engineering, no deep learning at all. In the last years, I have then further extended the textbook by providing open source Jupyter notebooks. So these notebooks include also music and audio examples along with Python code that implements all the MRR approaches described in the textbook. So that's as for the content. So as for the writing process, uh, I have to say this was a pain. So <laughs> I've had the plan to write a textbook in my head for quite a long time, but then putting uh, the plan into practice cost me two years of my life. So that's when I joined the auto labs that gave me the freedom also, also the time, so to say, uh, uh, that requires writing such a book. Um, I planned the writing process very precisely. So it was not just a vague idea. I really made a concrete plan. I reserved time to work on the book more or less on a daily basis. Often I started early in the morning at 5 or 6 a.m., including weekends. So I worked on the book from 5 or 6 to 9 o'clock for three, four hours, and then moved on with the daily business. Just to give you a feeling, writing one page took me an average three to four hours. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Writing a text, one page, three to four hours. In other words, The book has 500 pages plus 100 pages solutions for exercises. That means I worked in average three hours of work per day over two years. And the plan was to finish within two years and I did it. Uh, this was a tough time, but interestingly in this process, my experience as a long distance runner helped me a lot. So writing the book was like running a marathon. So when I was a student and uh, before having the kids, so to say, I, I ran a lot, uh, also marathons. And writing the book made me aware of phenomena like overpacing and stitching. <laughs> so then I knew I have to slow down a bit. I also encountered the famous, uh, the runners know what I mean, the man with the hammer. So that's uh, what you experience as the marathon runners uh, between kilometers 30 and 35. It's really painful. You want to give up. But once you have this experience, you just move on. Uh, uh, so besides working in a very structured fashion, it also helped me a lot to ask for regular feedback from different people. So for example, even in the book's early stages, I kept passing on parts of, for proofreading, yeah? already in uh, the first one, two, three chapters. And I found students and people who gave me very constructive, but again, painful feedback. I could incorporate right from the beginning on and then, uh, yeah, and then improve the writing skills for later chapters. So that was the long story for the writing process. Yeah, that's, that's thank you for sharing this. I think it's it's very beautiful. I also wrote down uh, this advice because it, uh, I believe, it applies to to such long term projects and it to have like uh, it it directly applies also for writing a PhD thesis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's exactly the same experience. 
it's really more writing, in the, especially in the final phase of your PhD thesis. It's not a sprint. I mean, what you can do for learning for an exam, yeah, you learn two nights before the exam. That's like a sprint. You cannot do this when writing a textbook or a PhD thesis. You need to work on the thesis bit by bit on a daily basis. You need to reserve time for yourself. Yeah, Finding time slots where you block them completely for yourself. Yeah. Exactly. So having a concrete plan, reserving the time, uh, what I also find beneficial, like working at, at the project in the morning in the sense that uh, you get this done and it's like your day is already successful. You can focus on, on the remaining tasks and uh, then pacing, the right pacing. So not overworking, not sprinting, but having the same constant, more or less constant pain and also being aware that at a few points there may come uh, kind of a, I don't know, burnout or, you know, like you want to uh, have the uh, motivation maybe to, con to continue or you won't have the, the feeling to continue, but you'll need to do this anyway. Exactly. And very and important to communicate to us yeah. at an early stage. So feedback. thinking of, I first want to make it perfect and then I give it to us. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, a, a major uh, a mistake you can do. You need to be brave enough to give something to others already at an early stage and then learn yeah, through the process, uh, get, getting this uh, back and forth like ping pong. Yeah, that's, that's very solid advice right there. Thank you. Thank you for it. Uh, you mentioned one of the things that you mentioned about the book is that it doesn't contain any deep learning. It contains... Uh, it contains like classical engineering algorithms, we could say. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that a lot of your already published research and uh, research of your PhD students on your, I guess, your current research as well, already touches on the area of, of deep learning. I would, uh, I would like to ask you to maybe somehow, you know, uh, say a few words in the context of the also recent developments in AI also in the area of, of music. So how would you describe the role of artificial intelligence in, in music processing? Mm. And how is it reflected in uh, your research, recent research? Mm. Yeah, indeed. I mean, as in all, in all areas of data processing, deep learning techniques have had a huge uh, impact on research, uh, also in audio and music processing. And there are many MRR tasks where deep learning has led to major improvements. Maybe one such example is uh, called blind source separation, which is known to be a notoriously difficult problem area uh, when using traditional uh, signal processing and machine learning techniques. So in the music domain, uh, you may think of a karaoke application where for a given song, you want to separate the vocal track from the accompaniment, for example. And only in recent years, uh, deep learning techniques have led to a major breakthrough for, for this task, uh, also known as singing voice separation. Uh, the results are so convincing that they are now used in commercial applications. And of course, industry also has been the driving force, uh, having available all the training data and the reference annotations needed to train such systems. Um, so, I mean, that's the general knowledge that end-to-end uh, -end processing pipelines that integrate feature extraction and classification or analysis are, yeah, are powerful tools. So that's one main reason that uh, such techniques uh, overperform hand-engineered techniques where you do feature extraction and classification, for example, in two separate steps. And also it's common knowledge that uh, on the downside, so to say, uh, that data-driven techniques are data-hungry and their behavior is often hard to understand and so on and so on. Uh, so I think discussing uh, the blessing and curse of deep learning techniques is topic being worth a podcast of its own, I guess. 
And there are certainly researchers who can comment on this topic more competently than I can. Uh, as for my work as university professor, I see my mission in consolidating these techniques, in understanding these new technologies better, and trying to explore and adapt them uh, to the music domain. Okay, and uh, is this what is your current research focus on? So definitely, this is one one uh, one important uh, research direction. So uh, as for uh, the new technology, I'm particularly interested in its combination with traditional engineering approaches. Uh, so combining uh, traditional engineering with recent, let's say, differentiable learning techniques. I prefer the technique over deep learning techniques. So you can exploit all these cool new platforms uh, and tools uh, for automated differentiation. So combining, so to say, uh, classical approaches and deep learning approaches, we uh, try to build uh, hybrid models that require comparatively few training data, uh, systems that are explainable and less vulnerable Uh, to data biases and confounding factors, so that I gain general principles applied by many researchers now. Uh, I'm particularly interested in certain components of the deep learning pipelines, namely the shallow ones at the beginning, input representations, mm -hmm. are preparation data augmentation techniques, which again requires a good understanding of the scenarios and, uh, and the data, the music data itself. So we try to learn here from music experts, yeah, learning about the nature of the music and the kind of invariances your systems should fulfill. And then I'm particularly interested in the very end of these networks, the loss functions. Um, and this leads to, again, a very deep and interesting uh, mathematics uh, For example, when you think of loss functions based on differential alignment techniques that are then applicable to weakly aligned scenarios where you have only poor training data, poorly aligned training data, or loss functions uh, that are related to Wasserstein distances or more generally optimal transport. And if you then follow this path, you <laughs> quickly get involved in deep mathematics, which leads me back to my original career as a mathematician. So, uh, yeah, I, I love this kind of really broad uh, perspective on, uh, on, 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 on research, uh, starting with a concrete application like music and audio, uh, problem modeling, uh, the design of algorithms, implementation, evaluation, and then coming back to the application too. So to consider the entire research cycle involving uh, engineering, computer science, mathematics, and then at the same time having a close uh, yeah, communication and interaction with domain experts, yeah, even uh, collaborating with musicologists, for example. So... So that's, so to say, uh, what I love to do uh, and where I can learn a lot. Yeah, so it's amazing that you actually uh, went there and back again to, to the mathematical field. And I'm sure that, that the mathematical basis is incredibly useful because I've seen that some of the hardcore deep learning papers are really deeply into mathematics. So it's not just, you know, we take data and do whatever on it, but it's really deeply grounded in mathematics. So, uh, yeah, I wish, I wish I had that knowledge <laughs> to understand them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but yep. so. <laughs> uh, that stuff, uh, pretty quickly, it really goes deeply into whatever field, let it be differential equations. When you think of diffusion models, Or, or of functional analysis when you look at optimal transport and then you end up with uh, measure theory and stuff like that. Or So, I mean, wherever you go deep, you end up in, uh, in, in pure mathematics very quickly. Well, that's, that's beautiful. So uh, 
regarding research, maybe uh, there's this one thing that that really interests me about all professors of this world is that um, at this stage that you are now in your career, do you still get the time to uh, do your own like personal research and implementation, or you really don't have the time for it and you must focus on on supervising the your research group and and working on their projects mostly? I mean, the nice thing of becoming a professor or being a professor is that you have a choice. You are free in some way. Uh, you can decide on your own research agenda. You can decide on the size of your group. Uh, you can decide on your working style. You can decide on whom you gather in your group. Uh, of course, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to uh, to find time for yourself. Uh, I still consider myself, at least <laughs> I consider myself, I don't know what my students think, <laughs> but I consider myself still being an active researcher. Um, uh, besides managing my group, besides supervising uh, students. Um, so I think the the trick is that that you you try to align your personal research interests with your interest of your let's say doctoral students so of course i have some personal research interests and i try to make my students enthusi enthusiastic about these topics but this is not a one way thing so at the same time i also I also try to align my own research interests uh, with those of my doctoral students. Uh, so I try to learn from them and try to get enthusiastic what they are interested in. And this really drives me forward. This also drives me into deep learning. Uh, this drove me in learning Python myself. Yeah. So I was a MATLAB guy. Uh, when I did my research, I did MATLAB. And then all my students wanted to use Python by obvious reasons. And and so I switched to Python myself. And that was one reason I started with the FMP notebooks uh, that accompany my book. So the main reason was actually the FMP notebooks are the result of me trying to learn Python <laughs> from my students. And it's a documentation of my learning uh, uh, endeavor, so to say. Yes, uh, so I still do personal research by aligning with my students and uh, I would not call it supervising, I would call it collaboration with my students. Of course, I have more experience concerning maybe uh, uh, how to structure things and how to uh, uh, maybe uh, yeah, how to find a good path. But at the same time, my students are much more gifted in terms of some of them have an excellent musical education. Uh, I have a pianist in my group, I had a drummer in my group, a composer. Um, I have excellent programmers, people who, uh, I mean, who have absorbed deep learning uh, from the beginning, so to say, and so I benefit a lot from them. So it's a collaboration. Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing to say. And uh, is it this, this, uh, enjoyment from collaboration, this passion for learning, this passion for research. Is this what motivates you in the day-to-day -day work? This is, this is what, uh, that's the only source which should uh, give you the motivation for, for the day-to-day -day work, so to say. It's really the encounter with people who love what they do. Yeah. So the encounter with people who are highly motivated, so to say, I want to see the eyes shine or sparkle yeah with enthusiasm and this is what drives me forward oh that's that's beautiful and uh, finally when uh because it, it's obvious that you're involved in, in a lot and also i think the definition of of professor is that you don't have uh, much free time left so on a more personal note, I wanted to ask you, how are you able to handle professional and personal life? I mean, it's a matter on how you define free time. 
Uh, sometimes reading a paper on the weekend, I consider as free time, something I may enjoy. So in other words, I, I do not draw a clear boundary between my professional and my personal life. So it's all, it's all mixed up. Even my wife, uh, which I got to know when we both did a PhD uh, at the same lab, uh, she also works in music processing and she also works uh, in the audio labs part-time as a research assistant. So I meet her at home, but also in the institute. Even my daughters visited me so, <laughs> at the institute, going to the canteen, having food. Uh, so in my life, I at least try to find a good balance between, let's say, work and relaxation. So activities with my family, with my students, colleagues, and friends. And again, there's a huge overlap. Yeah, so many of my colleagues or students I consider friends or yeah, people I really love to spend time, also in the evenings, having a beer or uh, uh, doing something else. So for me, being a professor uh, is more than, yeah, it's more a way of life, let's say, a, a vocation rather than simply an, simply an ordinary job. Okay, I understand. And do you still uh, jog? Do you still do some kind of sports to relax as well? Yeah, so sports is my medicine. Okay. Without my sports, I would not survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, I don't do it... I mean, I, I do it in a re relaxed fashion. I like running, I, I play table tennis in a team also and meeting people, so... Uh, and that's uh, just the right balance I need. Yeah, I also believe it. It may be one of the most important pieces of advice that you gave during during this this podcast episode. Uh, Meinert, thank you, thank you so much, thank you for taking the time out of your professor life. Thank you for sharing all these things with uh, people also outside of the academia or people who have not benefited uh, by having a, a mentor. I, I believe they really will find this information very valuable. And at the end, uh, I wanted to ask you, if someone wanted to contact you, is it possible? Is, it, is there a place where you would recommend they go and they could contact you? Yes, definitely. So I'm not active, so much active in social media. So my suggestion is that Maybe please first have a careful look at the sources and information available on our websites and in our repositories. And then please feel free to write me an old fashioned, compact, personal and informative email that makes me curious about you. Yes, and please, please no spam. Please no spam. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you once again. And I wish you all the best for all your future endeavors. Uh, thank you, Jan. It was my pleasure. All right, everyone. That was Professor Meinhard Müller of the Audio Labs in Erlangen in Germany. As usual, all people, places and references mentioned in this podcast episode can be found under dwolfsound.com slash talk012. Once again, it's dwolfsound.com slash talk012. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Meinart, once again for this interview, for the time you took to prepare for it, for the little discussion that we had before and afterwards, and also for all the common experiences during my master's program and all the work that you do for the students and for the digital signal processing community. And to you, dear listeners, I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you can, please leave a review of the podcast on Apple Podcasts. And you can always submit your feedback and guest ideas in the comments on YouTube. I always highly value them, even if I don't always have the time to answer each and every comment in detail. Don't forget about the audio plugin developer checklist, which you can get for free at dwsound.com slash checklist. And you can already put there your music processing knowledge into practice. And thank you for tuning in for this podcast episode. And I hope to see you in the next one. Take care.